relatively ineffective though, because he angered so many of the big money donors. So the square deal, this very progressive plank, most of these things would not be passed. And then in 1907, a panic hit. It was called, what? There you go. Oh, I didn't finish Trustbuster, did I? Oh, oh let's, let's get back to this. Let me finish the trust buster. He would actually use his Justice Department to bring up 42 cases of under the Sherman Antitrust Act. I'm sorry, I forgot the pen. I forgot to didn't tell you this. 42 cases, 24 would actually be broken up. Break up monopolies. As he called them, these were the bad trust. Bad trust. Literally, he called them bad. That they were restraining trade, stifling competition, putting out bad products. The two big examples we got to get to were the Northern Securities Trust, which was a big railroad trust, J.P. Morgan and J.D. Hill of the Great Northern Railroad. Hill and Morgan tried to set up this big railroad trust. Yeah. Were any of the was it the 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 vertical monopoly security? Almost all were horizontal. Okay, yeah. Yeah, vertical mon monopolies are really hard to prove that it's a monopoly. But doesn't how does the vertical monopoly raise the price? Because even if they control production and everything, how do they monopolize? Uh, can they do it a couple different ways? But one of the ways they can do it is by cutting costs. So so energetically, they can drive out competition. So so they can across 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 the board. Mm -hmm. And then the other big thing is with a vertical monopoly, they can use their, their power in a vertical monopoly to control the sales of all the goods. Like for example, Microsoft became a vertical monopoly because they, are, they got their programs to be put on computers that were made by Microsoft because they had a vertical monopoly, they kept other programs off. So everybody put Microsoft and, and they got really lazy and started putting out bad things. Lazy is a bad term, more like just green. Let me tell you very quickly about the Northern Securities Trust. Here's the Great Northern Railroad. Goes across Northern Montana. Very profitable railroad. What the Northern Securities Trust did is it included, it would include the bankrupt Northern Pacific that also had a link up with the Helena, and the Burlington route that spread through much of the Great Plains. It would basically control the, have a monopoly of railroad in the Northwest. That did that was not allowed to happen. Okay, they would actually do it in 1974. It would take them that long to finally get it. Creating the Burlington Northern. That was the Northern Securities Trust. And now the Northern Securities Trust, its descendants is Burlington Northern Santa Fe. This massive railroad trust. But that did not happen when Roosevelt was here. One more we have to get. He brought the case, even though it would not actually be decided until Taft was president. And that's what break up Standard Oil. Standard Oil had to break up a different component, like Standard Oil of California became Chevron. Uh, Standard Oil of Ohio became Standard Oil. Other ones, by the way, Standard Oil. That's how it became Standard Oil. One of the things that broke up Standard Oil of Ohio became Standard Oil. S O. How do you spell S O? S-O, right? S-O. That's what it became. And then as part of an advertising gimmick to catch people's eyes in the 70s, it became... Exxon. 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 Exxon's catch people's eyes. More than S's. It's still S-O in Europe. But it's Exxon here. So that was one of the breakups. And now that Exxon Mobile is a bigger monopoly than Standard Oil was. So we've got, we have actually more of an office. It's actually like more of the main two separate companies. Yeah, literally they had to, and, stand, and these kind of things, uh, they had to sell off the components. Okay. So like, so what if, what if there was no buyer? You have to keep dropping the co costs until somebody did. And it was just, if it's not sold so by this time, we're going to just take it. You know, it, actually what, what basically happens is someone's going to have to then administer an outside of your control until it's sold. 
But the panic of 1907, another major bank panic. And this one actually could have been much, much worse because not only was there an economic recession worldwide again, actually one that caused a lot of instabilities before World War I, but the thing was is that there's all these bank failures. Banks begin to collapse. And look at the financial, uh, the financial institutions of the United States might collapse just like 1893. There was no way the federal government could do anything about it. And so in a very just weird route from Teddy Roosevelt's Treasury Department to so the government gave money, billions of dollars, to J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan had this massive investment bank. And J.P. Morgan could distribute this money to various banks. The banks that were failing, they got an influx of money, and therefore they survived. Government gave money to Morgan, Morgan to banks. It showed that they needed a central bank. Remember that whole national bank controversy from the last semester and century? It showed it needs something to regulate and control the money supply because this barely kept the panic from going totally out of control and it could never work again. Yes. Um, yeah, J.P. Morgan's investment bank was big enough it could actually make these essentially no interest loans with U.S. government money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Was there interest on those loans? No interest on those loans. It was a loan that had to be paid back, but with no interest, it's basically free money. It's exactly what the Federal Reserve Bank, now the National Bank we have, gave to all the banks after after the 1908 crash. They gave them no interest loans because they were all going bankrupt. Only about 15 trillion. And then 1908 or 2008? 2008. Did I say 1908? Yeah. I bet 2000. Okay. Why would the system just never work again if it crashed that bad? Oh, this, this, this couldn't work again. This was really happening. This is a private bank who does not have the connections to all the banks. Yeah. yeah but the point is, it needs something more, but Roosevelt's going to be blamed for this, and he can't run for re-election. Roosevelt would have liked to run again, but Republic, big money interests in the Republican Party now could say, we don't want you back. And so Roosevelt actually could choose, handpick his successor. In 1908, the Republicans chose William Howard Taft, who actually did not want to be president. Yes. Um, why didn't we put Wilbur go back and just gave a lot of money? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, because because he actually attacked Trotz and wanted the square deal. They thought he, so he was not as conservative as they had hoped. And they gave him all this money in the 1904 election. And uh, it's kind of funny, too, that the government turned on and gave the banks all this money for doing terrible business practices. It's a little like what happened with uh, um, the U.S. government in 19, or 2009 when President Obama, who did everything he could for the banks to survive. And then they turned around and went against them in 2012. Well, what happened if the banks just didn't survive? Financial panic. But horrific like, depression. And then at the end, would... Big bank come back or would they be like way smaller? We'll see. <laughs> Probably have to be smaller. But it, what the problem is, it takes a very long time. It takes it takes years to come out of a financial bank. Years. All right. Taft did not want to be president, but and he was not all that progressive. But he was going to be Roosevelt's successor. And the Democrats, for the last time, ran William Jennings Bryan. And this was Bryan's worst defeat. Taft was reelected. What did Roosevelt do? He went off to Africa to kill everything that moved. He went on a massive safari, wrote a huge set of books about it. Roosevelt was a prolific writer. He literally could just write a thousand pages in a week. I'm not exaggerating. Photographic memory. Actually, some of the books are really good. Really tell a story. 
embellished greatly, but what the heck? Yeah, he was really worried that all the big game animals would, animals would be killed before he had a chance to kill them. <laughs> and then in 19, and then he went off to Europe and was treated like a king. And it was a big deal. Hmm? Yeah, you know, he's just such a romantic figure. You combine everything that he did. He kind of fit in with that. Uh, uh, America had a kind of a weird reputation of being coarse and rude, but also at the same time very dynamic and exciting. And he fit that. He just seemed like the quintessential American to people in Europe, which in many ways he was. And he liked to beat his chest and, and knock people out in the basement of the White House. Okay, so. How did he do that? Like, what? Okay, so Taft's presidency, <laughs> Taft's presidency, actually, he broke up more trust than Roosevelt. But Roosevelt's called the trust busters. But Taft had a couple big scandals. The first one was he promised to lower the tariff, yet the Billy sign barely lowered it at all. So the tariff issue, and then in conservation. Conservation really hit him. It's called the Pinchot-Ballinger Affair. Gifford Pinchot was Roosevelt's mentor when it came to conservation. And so Pinchot had Pinchot-Ballinger, that's a P-R. For, that's pretty good for Pinchot for me. That that looks like an H, doesn't it? Yeah, I deserve something. Nothing, nothing. But the Pinchot Ballinger affair. Are you highly me, I high five. Yes, and I. We should add, we should we should do this really quickly. I want to tell you, the Pledge of Allegiance was written at this time. I pledge allegiance to the flag and for the country which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was the Pledge of Allegiance when it was first written. No, not until 1951. We ain't godless commies. That's exactly why it was put. And then they added the United States of America in 1921. And until 1942, Children would do, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right? I'm not kidding about the godless commons. It was a cold war. But how did people do it? I pledge allegiance to the flag. Did you see an issue during World War II? Just a little minor issue. Anyone? Anyone? All right, so back to this. You should do less dance. Because it's just a Roman hail. Okay. Ballinger was Secretary of the Interior. And what Ballinger was doing was selling off government land at rock bottom prices and then taking a kickback. Remember the term kickback? Taking money under the table. Pincho exposed it. Taft was furious. Pincho, how dare you? And so he supported Ballinger, even though Ballinger was clearly taking bribes. Wait, so was he mad about him for blowing the good scheme that was making him money? Or was he just mad? Taft? Yeah. Taft was embarrassed. He didn't like the person who embarrassed him. No one like you know, kills a messenger kind of thing. Yeah. Don't tell me my administration is messing up. Sure you would be surprised how often that happens. But here's the big thing about it, though. Who was furious? Roosevelt. Roosevelt is reading the papers in Europe and getting this information. And he was furious. And when he got back, literally got off the boat in New York from his grand trip to Africa and Europe in 1910, he made it very clear that Taft had destroyed his legacy. And literally declared war on his chosen protege. And that leads to one of the best, most exciting elections in American history, the 1912 election. This is an election that has a little bit of the old, the new, they campaigned for themselves. It was a dynamic campaign. It showed all the different views of the United States, and it had 
four major candidates. It's a pretty incredible election. I've read a couple books about it. And I like this kind of stuff because it talks about the history of the area, but also how the, uh, the elections kind of personify what America was like. It's just a great election. And so, first off, there is now, looks like a viable socialist candidate, Eugene Debs. Debs, remember him from the Pullman strike? He had been getting more and more popular. The Socialist Party got more votes than ever before in 1912. This was an alternative to capitalism. A way to look at it was a left alternative. And there would be a viable opposition from the left until the Cold War. And then the Socialist Party in the United States, the Communist Party, would be destroyed. Cold War. Never did return. We have basically a middle party and then a pretty laws out there conservative party. Next, the Republicans. Roosevelt wanted to run again. He actually went to the convention. That had really never been done before. But they wouldn't let him in. They kicked the former president out. And he did these big processions outside the convention hall in Philadelphia. And they chose a man who didn't really want to be president, but he's still president, Taft. And Taft, he might not have wanted to be president anymore, but he now was furious at Roosevelt. And Roosevelt announced his candidacy. His candidacy is going to be the progressive platform. But everybody called it the bull moose. Roosevelt used to like to beat his chest, and he would do this thing. And beat his chest. And so in 1912, after he announced that he was going to throw his hat into the ring and run for president, he was asked, how do you feel, Mr. President? Once you're president, you're always Mr. President. At least so far, Mr. President. And he goes, I feel as fit as a bull moose. That's the bull moose party. There was a progressive party before, and there will be a progressive party after. But this really was a one horse party. It's a one moose party. It was Teddy Roosevelt. Yes. If you meet the age requirements, you need like three months. Yes, I think you could just. You have to run, but there's there are procedures that you have to do to get on the, the ticket in every state. And every state has rules about who is a viable candidate, and every state has different rules. So, it, you have to have a certain number of votes in the previous election your party to get on, or you have to go through a I believe it's a petition process to get on the ballot. If you like made your own party up, you be like five hundred. You got to get a lot of people. Though. Yeah. So is the Republican Party conservative? Okay, the Republican Party at this time, this is very conservative. I was going to say, I thought they were all No, no. The left was only Debs. Okay. Now, the Bull Moose, though, is more liberal. And the Bull Moose Party, it's going to be called New Nationalism. That's what Roosevelt's slogan is New Nationalism. It's basically the square deal. Finish the square deal. But it added two big things. First off, women's suffrage. Roosevelt would support women's suffrage. Now, there have been a couple of states that already had women's suffrage, including Wyoming and Utah. Montana would allow women to vote in 1914. But it wasn't required. It, no states could do it, but it wasn't national party, yes. So they needed an amendment to make every state to it. Montana was one of the first. And in 1916, Montana would actually say, and we'll talk about her a little bit more later, send the very first woman to the United States House, or actually to Congress. Yes? Before women's suffrage came around, could theoretically a woman have been elected, even if she couldn't vote? No. no. Was there a law against it? No, but it just simply was not a law. So a woman tried it. Yeah. Susan may have to be tried. 
And who was the first woman elect elected? A Republican from Missoula. And she was a progressive, very progressive. She'd be elected twice, 1916 and 1940. We'll get to why she didn't win a re-election a little bit later. Wait, who was it? Hmm? Who was it? Who? What? Jenna Rankin. Okay. Was elected twice, 1916 and again in 1940. But she didn't win for she didn't win re-election right away. Okay, so new national. One more thing. One more thing. He really came up with his concept of social welfare. Social welfare. I mean, we talked about this once before, this idea of social welfare. But what it came up to is this. Regulation of good trust. Break up bad trust. His idea became this. Bad trust, break them up. But good trust, and what a good trust is this, a monopoly that actually makes things more efficient, that runs smoother, they should be allowed, but then at the same time, heavily regulated. I'll give you an example of these. They're also called natural monopolies. Think about a utility that supplies electricity. A utility. Just imagine what would happen if we had five different utility companies supplying electricity. That means we'd have what? Five different sets of power lines. Do you see a problem? That is by definition inefficient. Or Think about Helena with its relative size. You know, Helena's not that big. I know you guys think it's huge and dynamic and exciting. But think about Helena. Just imagine we had 20 railroads. How long will those railroads survive? Uh, less than half a day. Yeah, we're too big to have one railroad. Or how many phone lines? Or anything like that. We're a natural monopoly that's more efficient. And so regulate them. So we don't want to break up all the trust. If it's more efficient, we should have good trust. And who decides good and bad? The president. Yeah. And so that's new national, but it's the square deal. It's finishing his vision of the square deal. By the way, his opponents would look at this and say, Roosevelt's become a what? Bomb-throwing anarchist. And then the Democrats. The Democrats are sitting pretty. The Republicans are now split. And so the Democrats, actually Roosevelt is hoping that they nominate a conservative quasi fair. They don't. The Democrats nominate a reformer, a progressive from New Jersey named Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was actually a Virginian, but he went to Princeton and would later on become president of Princeton College and then governor of New Jersey. So he's a southerner, but from a northern state. And he's an interesting man. Yes, he's a progressive, but he's also very ideological. He has a complete and absolute belief that he is always right and the immorality of anybody who disagrees with him. He is also would become the most racist president in American history, not saying a lot. You just spoiled Spoiled what? Oh yeah, he will win. I know I destroyed it. This is interesting. Roosevelt. Oh shoot. Now there's two progressives. He can't get all the progressive vote. With the Republican Party split, all Wilson has to do is show up and he's gonna win. But his program is going to be new freedom. Wait, why? Why is him running as being progressive? What it, Roosevelt was hoping he'd get all the Democratic progressives too. Okay. But now all the Democratic progressives will vote for Wilson. So there wouldn't be any split between those. Yeah. Progressives or any Wilson. But the Republicans are going to be split between Taft and Roosevelt. Well, and, why wouldn't the Democratic progressives go through? Because they got a progressive in their own party. No. And so, new freedom. 
And new freedom is essentially the same thing. It's basically the square deal. They agree on almost everything, including women's suffrage. Well, Wilson didn't really want it, but he probably had no choice. And he would not be very open to a while as president. But he had a different point of view. He wanted antitrust. Yeah, he wanted to break up all monopolies. And that would encourage competition. He did not see the difference between good and bad trust. And this is going to be a huge difference in the progressive party. So put an arrow or something connecting these two ideas. You have a lot of progressives believe, believing this and a lot of progressives believing this. Two different points of view. This one personified by Wilson, this one personified by Roosevelt. Antitrust, break them all up, good trust, bad trust. This in many ways will be a fatal flaw in the progressive movement, especially once World War II began. Well, the election turned out very much the way it looked like. Wilson would be elected, but certainly without a majority of the popular vote, but got all the elect or one electoral college. Roosevelt got more votes than any other third party candidate in history, but not enough to win. He got more votes than Taft, but the Republicans were split. Debs got more votes than any socialist had ever had. Was any socialist ever got more than that? Debs won in 1920, but up to that time. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, from prison. I'll tell you. And so, with this, Wilson's president. Taft was <laughs> secretly happy to be out of the White House, and a decade later he'd be appointed to the uh, Supreme Court, which is all he really wanted to do. Presidents usually just go off into retirement and do other things. He went to become a justice of the Supreme Court. John Quincy Adams went to the House. That's about it. Other presidents do other things. Okay, so let's get to Wilson really quickly. Wilson, who was very racist, would bring Jim Crow to the federal government. What was Jim Crow again? What would that do? Segregation. He segregated the federal government. The Lincoln Memorial had just been completed, and under Wilson's orders, it became segregated. The irony almost hurts. Wait, they only read. Like, there was a little black section. Yeah, it's it just unbelievable, I mean, how, and that would not end until, um, well, heck, it would not end until Harry Truman, 30 years later, over 30 years later. So, Jim Crow, but he did have some things that everybody felt they needed. One of the biggies, oh, almost forgot something. In 1913, two amendments would also be ratified. Started during the Taft Amendment, or Taft administration, two amendments. The 16th, allowing for an income tax. It's, it's very vague in the Constitution, especially because the idea of an income was foreign when they wrote it. And so they clarified the federal government and therefore the state governments can't have an income tax. And 17th, direct election of senators. The people can now vote, voters can, depending on what state can allow people to vote. No longer will be state assemblies. These two, by definition, are liberal. Conservatives did not want these. And so you still see conservatives talk about repealing this and this to this day. Conservatives today. It used to be Democrats and Republicans were, you know, the parties were a lot more, uh, Mixed stuff. Today it's only Republicans. Yeah. Uh, why don't conservatives want to pay tax? But they don't want to pay tax on their income. They, they consider that yeah. they consider that against laws of fair economics. Soon to be called supply side economics. Yeah. Before the state assemblies picked the legislature. Now it's going to be people. And yeah, there's there's talk. In fact, one guy was just elected senator.
from uh, uh, North Carolina. So yeah, we should go back to direct elections. Or I'm sorry, go back to state assemblies. Well, he also believed that uh, workers in restaurants should not be forced to wash their hands. Okay. I can't, I'm not kidding. Because the voters um, don't know what they're going for. They're, they're sure. That's his justification. What they want is more Okay, so also in 1916, Congress would pass the Federal Reserve Act. 1913. 1913, the Federal Reserve Act. 1907, it showed that it needed a bank. The Federal Reserve Act would solve this problem. And the Federal Reserve Act did this. The Federal Reserve Act would set up 12 regional banks. And through these banks, they would distribute money, loan money to banks, and in a way, regulate the banking system. If a bank wants to be able to borrow money from the Federal Reserve so they can loan it, they got to be part of the system and therefore open themselves up to regulation. And so the Federal Reserve can say, okay, we'll loan you money, but then you have to be careful on kind of risky loans you're going to do. No, they did not do this before 2008 crash. But that's the job. So is the theory that the Federal Reserve just loans the money and then the conditions of the loan are what regulates them, mm -hmm. so there's no actual you know, that's part of the law, but um, th there are other laws too to deal with the bank. But that's how the Federal Reserve System works. There are other laws that are passed, um, banking laws. The biggest one was in 1933, called the last Steel. Yeah. How many of the banks? How many of the banks? Well, there's still 12 regional banks. And so Helena's in the Minneapolis region. So if you see the Federal Reserve Bank, which is across the street from. Yeah. That's the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, it's the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. I mean, there are, there are, there are actually about five banks out of about 90% of the banking in the United States, but then there are hundreds of other banks. It used to be thousands. And then the Federal Reserve Board. The Federal Reserve Board. The Federal Reserve Board actually they're the ones who set the interest rates. They set interest rates. They set interest rates that these regional banks charge. It's called the federal funds rate. They set that rate. So when the economy, as they see it, is overproducing and might go into a bus, they raise the federal funds rate. Make it harder for banks to borrow money and therefore slow the economy down. In times are bad, they lower the rate, hoping that it would make it easier for banks to loan money. The problem was in the 2000s, they had the bank rate so low that when they when the economy crashed in 2007, 2008, yeah, they hit zero and that's it. And they're stuck. And the head of the Federal Reserve Board is one of the most important people in the United States appointed by the president. The current head of the Federal Reserve Board was appointed by President Obama, and her name is Janet Yellen. And she is arguably the second or third most powerful person in the United States, Janet Yellen. And most people have never even heard of her because they don't realize how important the Federal Reserve is. She's a shockingly important person. First woman to hold that position. A very accomplished economist. All right, let me tell you one more thing then really quick then. Or a couple more things really quick. The next year, the Clayton Antitrust Act. That strengthened the Sherman Antitrust Act. Not completely, but it made it easy to remember this would for his idea of, of limiting trust. Also, the Federal Trade Act. created the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. Same deal, regulates businesses. And those are the big ones we need to know from him. World War I, 
would kind of crush the progressive movement. And I'll talk more about these after World War I, but there are two amendments. The last two progressive amendments would pay pass at the end of Wilson's term. The 18th Amendment, the glorious experiment that got a jump start during the war, prohibition. It technically banned what? At first, it looked like it was going to be a success. We'll stop this evil. Then it turned into a disaster. And then the 19th, women's suffrage. Wait, I thought that wasn't going to be It's like the fact that we have, like, that everything applies to women is in the Constitution, but voting is. Voting is. Women can vote. <laughs> no. Equal rights is not guaranteed. Uh, yes. So for the prohibition, was it just like hard alcohol? <laughs> All alcohol. But then, well, you can make a small amount for yourself of that sort of thing. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the church. Okay, because I was talking to Kula and I was like, if you were a church, you could sell wine. And I was like, no, that's not what people care about. You know, I mean, technically, the church can still buy some. There could be some medicinal alcohol and a few things like that, but you know, it became a big racket selling the church. And then they. Yeah. So, the TC, it's called the Federal Trade Act. And it's just commission. Oh, I never told you about how President Roosevelt boxed in the basement of the White House. I never told you about him getting shot. Yeah, when he's giving a speech in Cincinnati in 1912 during the election, he had a photographic memory. So he had a 10 page speech. He read, he wrote it and memorized it. Would you like me to do that? Yeah. He folded it and put it in his pocket. The guy ran up, he brought me to hold and shot him with a derringer right there. But the speech was so thick it slowed it down. It's only lodged between the two ribs. And this is what he did. He went shook as they're tackling the guy. Blood began to pool in his feet. He looked at the audience and said, it takes a lot more than a bullet to stop a bull of moves. <laughs> and he finished the speech. That alone, yeah. Have a good day, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Right when you find work. And, and, right? Right. I'm going to quit recording now. Wave to the camera.